Uh, my name is Nia Wynne Thomas. I'm a senior producer at Sky Sports. Um, so just before we introduce the session, I'm just very delighted that Sky Sports are able to uh, sponsor this session. As you know, uh, this season at Sky Sports, we've welcomed a new addition to our live coverage. And I'm thrilled to lead our WSL programming with the aim of bringing greater analysis to the coverage of women's football. And a huge gratitude to Kelly Simmons and her team at the FA for all of their support. But part of my role, which is why uh, this, is, this session is really key, is even before we kicked a, the, a ball was kicked at the start of the season, I had to put together a team, um, a presentation team, who had an abundance of, abundance of knowledge and talent. And that included Lindsay Hooper, Jess Crichton, Seb Hutchinson, WIF's very own Jackie Oatley, and of course, led by the wonderful Caroline Barker, all of whom work across our coverage of Premier League, EFL, and international football. After all, football is football. But as our coverage grows um, across our football platforms, we look to evolve and uh, bring on the next generation as our uh, needs of our audience changes. And to pave the way for any aspiring broadcaster or commentator, especially as our coverage of women's sports goes from strength to strength. And I am always in awe of anyone who puts themselves in front of the camera or behind the mic. Um, Joe, I don't know if you remember, but when we had a session at the Premier League, Kelly Cates was asked, where do you get your confidence from as a broadcaster? And she said, I fake it. I think we all know Kelly, there's a bit more to Kelly than just faking it. However, and I fake it every single day. However, this... <laughs> However, this session hopefully will give an insight into a little bit more than just faking it when it comes to being in front of the telly. So the host for this session is Ruth Shaw. She's the CEO of the Premier League Charitable Fund, one of the biggest sports charities in the world with an annual budget of around £35 million. The charity helps people to achieve their potential through the power of football. There's a CV to come here, so bear with. Ruth previously carried out senior roles in government, including the head of soft power at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Deputy Director of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, and the Chief Executive of the Sports Ground Safety Authority. Safe to say, she likes to leave things better than she found them and is committed to making football a better place for women to work. Welcome to Ruth and her panellists. Massive thanks to Nia and to Sky Sports for sponsoring the session today because I think it's really clear there are allies, pioneers, champions everywhere we look and Nia is absolutely one of those. Um, I, I know for a fact that Michelle Moore is trying to make their group sound like they're having more fun than us <laughs> and that is what is, that is about. So I think for Nia and Sky Sports, let's give the biggest cheer you can. <laughs> I might have started something we can't finish though, because if it comes back, <laughs> we're going to be Mexican waving, we're going to get it all going on. Okay. Um, that was a very kind introduction and um, a really nice summary of my career. I'm not going to do the same for my panellists, so I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves actually. Um, we've got a half finish at 3.30, they've got so much to say, I know you're going to learn loads from them. We're going to leave some time for questions as well, hopefully. Uh, use social if you want to, uh, with Be Inspired or Women in Football. Uh, keep your phones on silent if you can, just uh, so we can not be interrupted as these brilliant women tell us their stories. Um, but rather than the full biography, and I'm going to start with you, Pippin, work this way around, could you introduce yourself using just three words? Words. Hard, actually. Um, <laughs> I can say what I do in three words. So I'm a freelance broadcaster uh, and presenter. So that is me in three words. Mm -hmm. And are there three words you would use to describe yourself or people regularly use about you? Um, outgoing, tenacious uh, and ambitious. Brilliant. Yeah. Love those three words. Um, Sue, over to you. <laughs> um, Mackham <laughs> will be probably one of them. <laughs> Loud, um, but actually, probably academic. Academic. Professor. You are a professor, and I should have introduced a professor to you. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. But, yeah. but that probably gets in, in most of the Twitter and stuff. So I mm -hmm. think that's good, and I think Sean made a really great point earlier about we should own those uh, credits and plaudits that we get. So, Professor Sue, thank you very much. Uh, Joe, how about you? What three words would you use to describe yourself? Um, I would say passionate, loyal, and. I don't know. Um, 
people say I'm a force, so I'll take that. Brilliant, mm. absolute force of nature. Um, now, Caroline, you thought this was a little bit harder, didn't you? And, and so I, yeah. I've given you a little way out of this. What three words would others use to describe you? Well, what I said when we spoke earlier is that I would describe myself probably as very loyal and quite um, tenacious when I'm representing my clients, um, which has led me to be called lots of different names by um, <laughs> media, shall we say, over the, over the years. Some of them not, not, not the nicest. Well, we might hear about those later, yes. or we might have to beep them out, yes. but uh, great. And, and then also by way of introduction, because three words is really hard, uh, could you tell people maybe your first football experience, whether that was personal, playing, watching, or professional, and your first role in the game? But I, I'll probably come back around this way again, Pippa, if you want to start. Um, there's a, it's a hard one, because I've, I've had a few firsts. So there was a first of me playing football as a child, um, and it was a massive one, because it was during... Um, like a summer camp, and the local area I lived in was near West Ham football ground. So I was playing there, um, and Harry Radnap himself was there, which was, at the time, if I'm honest, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I, was just a, I was just a seven-year-old child, and all the boys, they were like, oh my God, Harry Redknapp, and I'm like, okay, cool. Um, um, but then within working, my first ever experience in a press room was when I was volunteering for Millwall Football Club, um, and I was covering the WSL there, the FAWSL, and um, I got to interview some players, so that was, a first for me a few years ago, well, over a decade ago, actually. Yeah. Right. We're going to hear a bit more about that journey you took from Millwall through to being a multi million viewed YouTuber. So we'll come back to that in a minute, but thank you. Sue, so how about you? First football experience? So, as a fan supporting Sunderland in 1973, we won the FA Cup. Nobody told me they were never winning anything again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, after, and I didn't play football, uh, I'm too old really, um, that's a crap excuse, but it's, it's my excuse anyhow, uh, it was mainly netball and hockey at the time. But then in working life, I was working in a university and we were asked to pitch for running the League Managers Association um, training for uh, coaches and managers, which have been running for 20 years now, so that was my real start in football. Brilliant, what a lot of experience you will have from that I'm sure. Uh, Joe, how about you? Um, I'll do a Wembley one because we're at Wembley. So um, in 1991, I'm a massive Spurs fan. Spurs got to the semi-final of the FA Cup. We were playing Arsenal and they put it at neutral ground for the first time ever. And I was 11 years old and my, I'm one of four kids. My mum has always been a football fan. Um, my dad was off working. So my mum brought four of us um, aged under 12, four kids. She brought us <laughs> to the semi-final. And she th this was the most normal thing in the world. And I think that's why I've been really fortunate growing up. Like my parents didn't bat an eyelid about me working in football because it's what we did. And I just remember it was, um, so we, we won the game 3-1. I'm sure you'll all remember Gaz's free kick. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, it was getting near to the end of full time. And obviously it was rough, you know, it's the nineties. And um, these sort of lads, men, turned around to my mum and were like, it's all going to kick off. You better get the kids out. <laughs> and my mum was like, OK. And she literally grabbed the four of us and pulled us down Wembley Way. But um, yeah, it's, I love coming back to Wembley every time, whether it's for work or anything, just because I still remember walking up there as an 11 year old kid. It's the best day of my life. It's brilliant. And uh, those memories do stay with you. And I think for children, young people we're working with, creating those life changing or really memorable moments is amazing. Mm. Thank you. Caroline, how about you? Mate, I'm the eldest of three girls, and my dad is football mad so most of my childhood was just spent hanging with my dad watching football and then career-wise I worked in music so I, I started off in music PR and then in 98 when David Beckham got sent off in the World Cup I stepped in and started representing him on the PR side so that was my first football client. Great and then I think people would be fascinated to hear a little bit more about that if you're happy to share. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, because I worked in music, I presume that anyone in the public eye, whether it's like music or film or entertainment, politicians, all had PR people, managers, like your team to support you and protect you. And it was only after that that I realised that when that happened with David with the red card, there was, there was no one, there was no support system, because you had obviously the club, you had the FA, you had a football agent, but there was no one dealing with, with the media. And at that time, he was obviously getting death threats. There was the effigies. It was, it was quite a, quite a horrible, toxic kind of environment. Um, so yeah, so I stepped in. And then I, when I realised that footballers didn't have that, that level of representation with the media, that's kind of where I, where I started from and built a company from there. 
And do you find yourself in front of the camera as well, or are you usually supporting I, behind the scenes? No, I try and stay as much behind the scenes as possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's very wise, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to ask some of our panel who might find themselves in front, if you mm. can share your first experience maybe of having to go in front of the camera or speak to the media. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to start. Go on, Peppa. I knew you'd start with me, but <laughs> mine's not like a traditional way in front of camera. I just started in my bedroom with my laptop which is on the camera talking about football so the first time I had to do it professionally um, came many many years later when I kind of broke through into the industry um, but it's, it's always a nerve-wracking thing to do especially if it's a big story um, or it's a something massive um, but yeah it's all about having the confidence to speak about it first of all knowing what you have to say and just making sure especially now you have to think about legal things as well you don't overset the line or don't say too much and you just have to be on point with everything so it's a it's a nerve-wracking job and it comes with a lot of um responsibilities as well yeah and what training did you get were you self-taught did you get media training along the way so I studied at university sports journalism but I was mainly self-taught I wasn't able to finish my course because of Funding, so I went. It's a horror story. I went to university like three times. You know, you're supposed to. I come from a very educational family. My parents both got masters and all that stuff, and it just I'd never really been that type of person. But the route was finish college, go to university, and I actually did have good grades. So I went straight away um, to study. What did I study first? Drama, drama and performing arts with business studies. Um, didn't like it. Went and got a full time job. Then I went again and did public relations. Um, but then I felt pregnant, and I thought I was superwoman. I could do the course and have a young baby at the same time, couldn't. And then when I finally got back on my feet again, that's when I started sports journalism. Um, but at that point, they said, hold on a minute, you've had way too much funding, we can't continue this, because you, you're meant to do three or four years, isn't it? So when I finally figured out what I wanted to do, I couldn't actually do it. So that's why I took my own initiative to just start. Nice. I took what I learned from the, the one year I was on the course to just do it my own way. It clearly hasn't stopped you or held you back, so no, that's no. brilliant. And um, if someone here was trying to break into uh, media presenting and journalism, would you have some advice for them based on your journey? I think the times we live in now, it's always great to network, first of all, um, and meet people that are already in that industry. I mean, it's so much easier now because when I started, there was no Instagram. It makes it sound old, but there was no Instagram when I started. Um, but yeah, in the world we live in now, it's so much easier to put yourself out there as nerve-wracking as it can be, just get a phone out, any camera, and just start putting yourself in, ca in front of camera to be comfortable, to know that you can, because it's the first, I don't know how many people have spoke to camera before, but you think you know what you're gonna say, and then your mind goes blank, and you're like, I don't even know how to construct a sentence properly. So it's about getting that familiarity of being in front of camera, and I think, just put as many, if you want to be a presenter, of course, put in as many videos as you can out there, whether it's getting five views or 5,000 or 500,000, whatever it is, just be comfortable in, in front of camera. And, and how did it feel when you get to two million views on YouTube? That like, must have been, you know, pretty incredible. It's, it's insane. It, it, you know, it sounds crazy, but it throws me off sometimes. Because when I'm just filming myself in my room, in my personal space, you never know how many people are actually going to interact with that content. And when you get, sometimes videos go viral, it worries me. I'm like, who are all these people? <laughs> Why are they watching my video? <laughs> and it just worries me. And I, suddenly my space doesn't feel safe anymore. I'm like, this is insane. And you get so many interactions, so many positive ones, and you get the negative ones. And you're just like, this is mad um, but yeah it's a lot to take in it is um, I'm gonna turn to Caroline on that point because I know you support your clients around social media mm -hmm. which is quite a scary space for mm -hmm. a lot of people now but you know hearing what Pip has just said but also knowing about yeah. the work you do with your clients any thoughts on how, how women particularly can navigate that environment it's, yeah I mean it's a very difficult I mean, when I started there was no social media which also gives away my age as well but um, and so you were relying on just you know print media whatever was in the newspapers and dealing with that but there's obviously certain legalities around that. If someone writes a false or defamatory story, you've got some kind of like legal comeback on it. But what social media has meant is that anyone can put anything up mm. and you've got, you've got no control over it. So what we've obviously tried to do is we work very hard and we've got you know, a really good legal team in terms of just trying to manage that to protect the players. But I mean, sometimes the level, particularly the racist abuse that a lot of our clients get is it, it shocks me on a daily basis, I'll be honest. And I, I don't think there's enough being done with that. Um, and all we can do is try and tell the players not to look at it and just let us kind of, you know, manage it. And in terms of that, we'll plug into, you know, the Premier League have been pretty good on it. Um, the FA have been good on it. You know, there's, there's organisations and the clubs as well try and do as much as they can. But it's just, it's such an unknown entity still. Mm. Um, which is why I think all the campaigns to try and have ID for your um, social media is so important because then at least you can trace people. Yeah. 
And quite timely, because I think the online harms bill going through today is really yeah. going to try to make a difference. But is it worse for women? Do you have different advice for women than for men? I don't know if, I don't know if it is. I think it's, it's pretty much across the board. And I think it spikes in terms of kind of what's happening or what's going on. Um, and we sort of see that there'll be certain situations and a lot of people just jump on it and feel like they have to be firing stuff off and throwing opinions out there. So, I mean, I do feel it's an equal playing field when it comes to abuse on social media, sadly. It's a pretty awful thing to have equality in, but... The, <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Um, jo, you work a lot with clients as well through your role. Do you give them extra support or training around social media? Yeah, I think it's, as Caroline said, it's just become such a massive area for us now. And um, it's really hard because they're human. And, you know, however much you can say, don't read it, don't read it, turn off your notifications, they're going to look. Mm -hmm. If you're saying, don't read it, don't see what someone's yeah. going to say, mm -hmm. at some point, you know, even if it's three days after the incident, they're going to read it mm. and they are human beings. And the amount of times that Chloe and I have had clients on the phone, you know, midnight in tears. I've had, you know, especially the female players um, in tears about what's been said, whether it's racist abuse, sexual abuse, whether it's about their performance. I mean, it is a really interesting one because especially with the female players for years, you know, they've, they've wanted, they've aspired to being recognised, you know, being recognised on the pitch. But the problem is with that recognition on the pitch, you know, with the Sky Sports deal, with the BBC coverage now, they are faces. Unfortunately, with that comes the scrutiny, mm. which the men have had for years. And so we're at this really interesting period at the moment where they're getting all this attention and we're getting the right attention for performance and ability, but we're also getting attention because they are now subjected to all this abuse. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really hard. It's, you know, it's a thing we deal with daily. We don't have all the answers. All you can do as an agent is be supportive. Obviously, you know, as Caroline says, we have great legal people. So if it steps into the realms of this is now a legal issue, we can turn to our lawyers. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just being supportive, trying to remain realistic. I mean, the other thing to remember is I have a really great, um, I think we, there was some set a session earlier about your network and your friendship group. Mm. And I have, you know, I've got a Spurs WhatsApp group. And yeah, most of us are on Twitter, but some aren't. My mum and dad are not on Twitter, or my dad is, but my mum has no clue. My mum goes to football every week. She is not on Twitter. Mm. When you're in this industry, we live in a bubble world. We think the whole world sits on Twitter. My 11 school friends, I think there's two of us on Twitter. They don't care. So it's, it's really hard, like, because our industry is so based on perceptions, based on social media, based on numbers, how many followers have you got? I have to say to clients often, <coughs> when you go home to your family, they don't care about what's on Twitter. Who are these people on Twitter? They're not your friendship group. They're not your normal people. They're not your crew. They're just people in the industry. And I get it. Jobs depend on it. But let's be real about it sometimes. Mm. We're human beings. What do your friends think? What do your family think of you? That's what matters. And I, when you're in the middle of the storm and, you know, there's, everyone's piling on on Twitter, it's really hard to keep that sense of reality. But I don't know, I don't know what percentage of the population are on Twitter, but it's not 65 million people, is it? Um, so, yeah, I have, you have to kind of just be supportive in that way and just try and retain a little sense of what's important. Definite perspective sounds really yeah. important there. And, and you work with all sorts of athlete sports people transitioning from professional playing careers through to being on the side of the pitch presenting. What do you think, um, what do they generally find hardest? How do you help them make that transition? Ooh, um, I think one of the hardest things, especially if they've been professional athletes, so footballer, um, when they're then getting employed to be a pundit, let's say for example, it's really hard to be honest and it's really hard to criticise. So obviously they're getting employed for their opinion, but they've probably spent 20 years being told by press officers, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything, be generic. And I'm going, right, come on then, let's get you on match of the day. You better have some opinions because you've got three minutes to summarise that piece of play. Um, and I think that takes a bit of adjustment. Um, and also their peer groups. So obviously as pundits, if you've just retired, a lot of your colleagues, peer groups are still playing and it's very hard then to be critical of them, to be critical of your old team, um, but that's what you're being employed to do. Um, so it's just sort of creating a safe space for them to go, this is, this is okay, you know, you can analyse a piece of play, you don't have to be emotional about it, you're just talking about the piece of play and giving your opinion on that, but I think it takes a bit of time to have that confidence. Kelly Smith spoke about it earlier about having confidence, um, you know, 
we're paying you or the, the broadcaster are paying you for your opinion. The other thing I kind of think is you can't get it wrong. Okay. You know, this is, I can't, you're, you're employed because you have played for Man United for 16 years. I haven't played for Man United for 16 years, so who am I to tell you if your opinion's wrong? It's just an opinion, you know? So I think it's just, we have to support them in that, encourage them, but don't expect them to be able to do it. You know, you were playing for Man United last month and now I'm expecting you to go on TV today and be opinionated about it. It's, it's a transition period. I think we can come back to confidence because that's really key, but still I'd like to come to you because you've worked with League Managers Association for many years now um, and they're in a slightly different position from players, but they may also be being asked to not have an opinion on things. What kind of training would you give or what would the League Managers Association be giving for? So various things and obviously there's quite a bit of it that might be one-to-one -one training and so on, but in the courses, um, one of the challenges you get an absolute mix, so you'll get some people who've been professional players and they've had quite a lot of exposure to media as players, quite a lot of training and so on. And then every time it kind of surprises me that you'll get um, people who've come through, uh, coaches and managers, and they're either not very comfortable, not very confident. Sometimes they tell me they've had no media training. Some of them end up in the manager position. And so, you know, you get a complete range and you have to sort of work with the individuals on whatever they need. But as Joe was saying, they're part of what we do, obviously, as Pippa was saying, was, was, was partly um, what you can and can't say as a manager, how not to get fined, you know, <laughs> what, what, what opinions you could express and which ones probably don't say in the heat of the moment as you, as you come off the pitch. So there's a range of different things we're doing, but it, it is actually quite bespoke in terms of what the needs are. Some of them have done a load of media training. The women's game is interesting though, because obviously now people as professional players might have done more, but in the early stages of getting women through as players, coaches, managers, fewer of them had done media training, mm -hmm. had exposure. And, and if you've had media training yourself or when you see it, any top tips for people, kind of any, what are the key things that you take away from those training courses? I mean, you've got to bear in mind, I came into this, I was a marketer in the food industry, so I came in as a crisis communications, what to say if you've poisoned people with the pies. So I had a slightly interesting say, I, I then became an academic who I think I, I mopped up the entire media training budget because no academics wanted to talk to, to media and, and the university had a training budget. I was working in football and they were kind of astounded by the level of interest that suddenly appeared. Mm -hmm. So I, I got plenty of that. But one of the simplest things that I was told is, is you know, be prepared. If, if, you've, if you've got a short thing, what your message is, what it is you're trying to say, what your safe islands are that you can say along the way and how you're going to end. Mm -hmm. And acknowledge the question, bridge to what you want to say and then control it and get your messages out. Mm -hmm. On that, just I was just thinking about what you were saying there and what Caroline was saying earlier about David Beckham. It's, it's quite an interesting position, especially what, the one that Caroline and I are in, in that... The clubs will obviously have their message and their media training slash advice of what they want our client to say. But obviously, our only interest really is our client. So we have to come at it from that point of view. And I think sometimes for the client it can, or the athlete, it can be quite conflicting because I'm saying, we need to remember this, you need to say this. But the club are obviously saying to them, well, here's your brief, here's your message, this is what you've got to do. So much as we work so closely with the clubs and Carol and I are particularly I think very careful about our relationships with our clubs and we we work very hard at those relationships at the same time we almost are coming at it from two conflicting angles mm -hmm. because their interest is club and club brand and our interest is client or my interest is client and that can be quite difficult for the client I think or I think it's difficult for everyone involved as well because even when you're working for a media company and you have contact with a player through an agency or representative, they always most likely are happy to do that bit of content, but it may be the cl or either way, it could be the club that stops it from going forward and everyone involved has to be happy and it could be something that could take two minutes to make and end up taking a year in planning because everyone has to be on the same page and by that time it's not a point of interest no more. We don't want to talk, we don't want to talk about what happened in the Euros now, it's happened. Like, you know what I mean? So it's really hard to get everyone on the same page at the same time. 
that's really interesting. Um, I said we come back to confidence, uh, and people, I'm going to ask you, uh, how confident are you, and have you always been, would you see yourself as confident? I think I was way more confident when I was younger. It's so strange because I was always the one that was speaking. You no, know, I've gone through phases. When I was younger, I was the quietest one in the room. I've, I come from a massive family, and I'll be the one that doesn't speak at all. Everyone will come in the house, and I'll just smile. <laughs> um, but then as I got to, my dad put me in theatre school at the age of like eight or nine and that's when my confidence began to grow. Being on stage, I, I got thrown into um, doing a solo piece at Her Majesty's Theatre at the age of 11 and at that moment I realised there's no reason to be, like just be fearless. Because once I did that I realised I can pretty much do anything. It was a huge theatre full of people that I didn't know. Um, and that's when I had my confidence. But then you go through these stages in life, like most people, you go through adolescence and then things start to change. I've always loved football. And then I got to, I think, college times and I felt like, oh, I'm not feminine enough. I don't like the fact that I'm such a tomboy. And then you just go through these things. That's when I lost confidence again. Um, and then becoming a mum at a young age, all these things decipher your confidence. But the cycle of life, I've gone back to being confident again. So I had to go through the phases and then I've got the confidence back. That's a really good point. None of us are just one thing, are we? We're not confident or not. We're kind of sometimes confident, yeah. sometimes not. And uh, Nia made a really good point as well about faking it sometimes. So do you have any tips or advice on if you're not feeling confident but you want to or need to, how do you fake it till you become it? So I'm like, I was the quietest kid. Nobody believes me now. It was a really <laughs> shy, quiet, spotty, spotty. I had it all going on, you know, frizzy head. Um, but I did some public speaking training when I was about 18, 19. And, and I actually got into doing more. I mean, I do quite a bit of speaking and lecturing and stuff now. Got into doing it because I hated it. It was almost like making yourself pick up spiders. It was like, if I do it enough, I'll get a bit better at it. Um, but it is genuinely that fake it till you make it. And sometimes we all have those days when for whatever reason, you might do it how many times, but you're off to do something and you're like, I'm not, not feeling good about this. I'm a bit worried about it. I've done other subject matter or whatever. And they talk about your, your brain listens to, you know, even your inner voice. Mm -hmm. And it mixes the chemicals of like, if you like worried or whatever, it oh, and do worried chemicals, yeah. Um, so you've got to play the positive tape through your head, I always find. You know, break the mood, whatever that is for you, exercise, music, whatever, but play the positive tape about the things that have gone right, not the things that could go wrong. So a, lot, a lot of people use music, actually, particularly in sports. You know, so do you have a motivating song or something that really gives you that? Mm -hmm. I used to listen to um, Destiny's Child um, Survivor before I went into a very difficult <laughs> job every morning on the way into the office. You know, I'm a survivor. I'm going to make it. And it's not my current job, by the way. But um, do you have music? That I'll motivates? be really dull on that. I don't have music. No, I yeah. just have lists and bullet points. I'm like, oh. let's just prep. Let's just prep. Let's just prep. Right. Because if you're not feeling it, you've, you've kind yeah. of almost yeah. injected it. So especially with clients, we spend hours, we spend hours and hours and hours going over stuff. You know, we're rehearsing press conferences, we're rehearsing answers. When there's, say there's a big story and you know, I've got a client on Football Focus or a client on Five Live or on TalkSport that night, we rehearse everything, we read everything. We, I spend hours reading all the newspapers, all the internet, everything, anything I can find that I think might help your argument or your opinion, I'll just send it, send it, send it. And, you know, the clients that I work with are so religious about their prep mm -hmm. and that's why. So if you have a little wobble or if something throws you or, I don't know, your talkback's messed up, it doesn't matter. You can just almost go to default, which is almost like you go into auto, yeah. autopilot because you've practised it and rehearsed it. Yeah. Yeah. That's preparation, so everyone's shaking their head. I think preparation sounds like a key yeah. for everyone. 100%. Yeah. And yeah. practice as well. I mean, I, I was so nervous to do my first bit of live TV and I've done live broadcasts so many times, but on my own channel, of course. So that's my audience, and I'm used to them. If I mess up, it's not a problem. But when you're doing it for a massive broadcaster, and you think, if I mess up, this whole channel could, you know, Twitter's going to go in an uproar. Um, <laughs> so I remember one of my first times, my, my talkback wasn't working at all. And I'm all new to talkback, first time having things in my ear. And I'm like, what on earth do I say right now? There's no one talking to me. And you just, you literally just go into autopilot, and you just act as this is natural. What would you do if it was your own TV show? Just keep it going. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and Caroline, you've done a lot about crisis comms as well, particularly, mm. but anything that you have to prepare or lessons you've learned from doing crisis comms that we could just put into practice in every day? I mean, the thing that, like Joe said, is preparation. In the normal day-to-day, -day, it is all about all of that. And even with clients, I'll always be like, what's the worst case scenario? And let's work back from there. So there's no surprises. The problem with crisis comms is that 
anything could, could land on your desk. Like, literally, we've dealt with every scenario there is going. And it's funny because I noticed today it's 10 years since Fabrice Mwamba collapsed on the pitch. And actually, that day, I didn't represent him, but his agent um, looks after Theo Walcott, who was my client. And that day, at, when it happened, he called me and said, look, we've, we've got a situation, Fabrice has collapsed. We're just getting this onslaught of media. Can you just step in and deal with it? And there's nothing that prepares you to deal with that mm. stuff, because even at that stage, we didn't know if he was going to survive or, or not. And just communicating with doctors, media, just managing that. Um, and you, there's no way of learning that. You just, ha you just have to throw yourself in and just try and, and figure a way and navigate through it as the best you can and advise everyone involved on, on how to handle it. And how do you personally keep calm in a crisis? What are your techniques? Um, I, I don't know if there's any way of doing it. I just, you, you just kind of deal with the problem because it's there. Because a lot of what we all do is, is problem solving, particularly with clients. Like you just, mm. what, what are the scenarios and how do we, how do we deal with this? So you don't even, I think sometimes you don't even get a chance to be nervous or think about anything. So you are just like, right, mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just deal with what's in front of us. A lot of it's common sense, isn't it? Like yeah. I, I often say to my clients, just be a human. Yeah. You know, if they ask you a question and you don't, you know, especially in recent weeks, just be human about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. We don't know the answers always. We're all trying to work out where we're at. You know, like Caroline says, you know, the Fabrice thing's thrown on your lap. You don't, you don't know the answers, you just keep calm and have yeah. common sense. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's funny, we're, we're recruiting for a, a job at the moment and I, I said to the consultant who's helping me, she said, so what do you want to put on the job spec? And I was like, can we just put love's football and common sense? <laughs> that's, ultimately, that, that's it's, what you need in yeah. this game. Um, it's interesting, the Fabrice, because that's, yeah. you know, we obviously yeah. work closely, but I was producing the I'm night that, my yeah, yes. and Fabrice, yes. Sue's, yes. Sue's trained him. Yeah. And um, again, you know, I was live producing Fabrice's collapse. I probably mm -hmm. dialing Caroline and, yes. you know, like mad, like what's going on, what's going on. You are just all kind of winging it. Yeah. But if you've got common sense and you communicate, <laughs> yeah. hence, client athlete being interviewed by a presenter it's a communication yeah. thing yeah. you know it's not a them and us always it's a look you need to write about this i'm trying to sort of give you something mm -hmm. i'm trying to get my message out there let's just communicate with each yeah. other and we can all probably get what we want yeah sounds like a lot of it is not the dark art we think it is but just some pretty basic yeah. common sense mm -hmm. and human things so it, it with that in mind is there anyone who either a client that you represent or somebody you've interviewed or trained who you think really just does this very well either presents with confidence like who stands out for you as a role model that we could be kind of watching and seeing do this really really well Ooh. that's a tough one yeah there's, there's so many amazing i'm going to go dion dublin who was my first ever client uh, because, well, talking to Fabrice thing, Dion was on air when Fabrice collapsed. And Dion is one of those people that whatever you throw at him, he'll be calm. So he, him and Chappers that night were incredible, Mark Chapman, and held it together. And, you know, I, we were throwing all sorts of things at them. And this is where we're at. And we're going live to the ground. And this is your next guest. And they, they took it all in their stride. Dion, you know, spoke very well on racism. He spoke very well on sexism. Um, he's a leader. But again, it's because he's a human being. Um, yes, he's articulate and he's a, nice, he's a nice guy, but ultimately he's a human and he has that kind of empathy with whatever you throw at him. Um, yeah, so he would probably be... Sounds good. Somebody who springs to mind. Mm -hmm. Any others? I mean, the thing is, we've had so many, and yeah. what I always end up saying, that it's not a cop-out, really, <laughs> but um, it's... Everybody has their own style. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. pick out somebody because you go, they're really articulate and they're quite funny or they're charismatic or they're whatever. But everybody can learn to do it in their way. And, and it's not like a, that makes a great speaker and that doesn't. And you've been talking there about Fabrice. And one of the things that struck me when Fabrice came through courses and, and did that mm -hmm. kind of thing was he had absolutely this message that he was now trying to get out there about not just his experiences, mm -hmm. but the, the medical checks and so on. And, Anybody who's got an authentic message like that, that mm. to me is really powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think that's a cop out at all. And I, I remember when I first came into football 10 or so years ago, and I, I kind of loved Barack Obama, the energy. The style, I, and I kind of had this vision of myself being like Barack Obama on stage. And I very soon realised I'm nothing like Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I had to present to a UEFA conference full of, you know, 100 
former police and safety officers. And, and I realised that my superpower was not being brack and dazzling and inspiring, but being competent, credible and, and calm mm -hmm. and actually telling them what they want to know. So I think if you do it in your own way, that's probably much more yeah. impressive yeah. than trying to be someone else. Yeah. So um, I'm, we've got about 15 minutes left and it is a hard finish. So I want to give some chance for questions from the floor. I've got a million other up my sleeve because these women are so interesting. But if anyone wants to ask a question, now you have uh, these brilliant people in front of you. Put your hand up and we've got a mic and we can come round to you. Um, otherwise, I shall just indulge myself and keep going. But uh, we've got a question at the back in the middle, I think, um, by the camera. I, I also think Jackie Oatley's brilliant, actually. I oh, just yeah, think the way she, she has such a warm, uh, yeah. personal approach, but super professional, yeah. too. So I always feel it's a privilege to be with Jackie. Hi, ladies. Um, just got a question about confidence. Do you want to say yeah. who you are and where you're from as well? Yeah, sure. Thank I'm you. Victoria. I'm a lawyer at UEFA. Um, and, yeah, just a question about confidence and working in such a male-dominated in industry. Um, I'm very lucky at UEFA there's a lot of supportive men and I'd even say feminists um, in men but you know often on a day-to-day -day basis I'll be in a meeting room with sort of two to up to 40 men sometimes and I'm the only female and inevitably you do get the odd sort of eye roll or the stare that you know you can just read it they think you know nothing nothing about football let alone the law um, wow. <laughs> yeah, my favourite thing is often it happens so often, you know, you're in a meeting of men and the meeting organiser says, okay, welcome gents, mm. which immediately, I don't know, on a day when you're not feeling so confident, that those feelings of imposter syndrome do come in. So I was just interested to know, because you guys must have all been in a similar situation, um, probably many times how you deal with that, you know, eye roll that you see or the blank stare um, or sort of shows of, you know, not believing in you as a woman. You know, do you confront it head on or do you pick it up later on with your manager or, you know, just be interested to hear what you, how you guys have dealt with that in the past. Great question and I think probably everyone could give some advice but yeah. anyone want to start? Oh, well, I remember, I mean, one of mine which was early days with David where I was doing all of his comms globally, which was, you know, quite full on. And I've been doing it from 98, so through to the Japanese World Cup. And I turned up at the hotel in Japan to, to meet with him, and he sent someone from the FA down to, to meet me, to come upstairs. And they asked me, was I his hairdresser? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. But I think that just fuels you on, because I was like, no, I was like, Ask David what I do. <laughs> I thought, I'm not even answering you. And I, I think, you know, for you in that room, like you're in a powerful position, you should just use it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I'd agree. I think um, male allies are really important. Mm -hmm. um, I was, when I was in my old days, when I was a producer, I went to Real Madrid to do a documentary with a certain football manager, with a male presenter, and there was only two of us. And everything said manager wanted to know, he asked the presenter, and the presenter just kept turning around and going, ask the boss, mm -hmm. ask the boss asked the boss took him two days before he even spoke to me like <laughs> I mean genuinely took him two days but I I kind of don't mind it because I quite like being underestimated part of me okay. it's almost like flip it and use it as a skill yeah honestly underestimate me yeah. go for your life because mm -hmm. I've got you every day of the week <laughs> and I've had to work 10 times harder so I probably know 10 times I'm not saying I know 10 <laughs> times more than everyone but just I kind of think you've got to flip it in your mind if you yeah. sit there and go they think I'm rubbish, they think I don't know anything. Oh God, I don't know anything. They're gonna test me, they're gonna ask me a question, I don't know the answer. You can really get into a little hole. And whereas, sometimes they can see that weakness yeah. going. Yeah. Oh God, oh, like yeah. you start wobbling, yeah. your voice goes, you get a bit nervous. I get, I get really clumsy when I'm nervous. I start dropping things, I'll spill the water, you know, getting all flustered. <laughs> but I think if you kind of just flip it in your head and go, oh, they don't think I'm great. Okay, yeah. that's cool. I'll just bide my time on this one. You just stood up in front of a whole room and went, hi guys, I'm a lawyer at the FA. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I mean, exactly. hello. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of own it. It's, that's incredible. But it's, sometimes it's us. It's not yeah. how people are treating us. It's how, what we're giving out. I did it the other week at Leaders. I went to the Leaders Conference and um, I arrived on day one and I'll, it was not like this room at all. It was probably 80% male and it's global and in my head I was like god all these important people and they all run football clubs and they're all and I stood in a corner and I was like no one wants to talk to me I'd, 
I'm not useful to anyone. I don't know who to talk to. I ended up talking to the man who was so amazing serving the coffee. I chatted to him for about <laughs> half an hour. Now. And then I left at about three o'clock. So I just, I wasn't getting much out of it. It wasn't amazing, but it was me. And I went home and I had to have a little word with myself. And I was like, that was you because you probably stood there not looking interested, not looking open. You probably looked a bit moody. There were so many people in that room who didn't know anyone, but I didn't make the effort. So I went back, I made myself go back the next day and I put different clothes on and I kind of put my makeup on and I spoke to people and I had such a good day. So sometimes I think it's, it's on us, like we can sit here and moan all we like, yeah. but we're in charge. Mm -hmm. One of my little tricks as well is if I'm not feeling confident to do it myself, I think about can I do it for someone else? So, you know, if I ask the first question, will other women in the room yeah. think, well, I'll put my hand up too? I think there's evidence that suggests that if the first question comes from a woman, more women ask questions, things like that. So you did well asking the first one. Yeah. Um, but also, it, I hate networking, but if I think I'm helping somebody else, like see someone on their own and introduce them to somebody else, then it makes it a lot easier. So sometimes you could reframe that if you do it, you'll be helping others as well as yourself, I think is quite quite a good one yeah um but great question any other a question over here if we have the mic uh, and if you just want to say who you are and where you're from and ask you a question and if it is to one feel free or if it if it's a general one we'll see who wants to answer uh shall I stand up yeah again? please do <laughs> it's kind of to everyone so i'm grace from deloitte sport business group um and i just wanted to ask as a woman when you portray confidence there's often sort of negative connotations that come with that so or it could either be overconfident or bossy or, or maybe too bubbly or over friendly so I was just wondering from your experiences is there a way of portraying confidence as a woman that doesn't have those views or actually is that not the problem is it that people view it that way and how do we change that it's so funny you ask that because when I was going to come back on the question here I was going to say don't take my advice because I would come back as Sometimes maybe some people may call it ignorant. If, someone was, if I was in a boardroom and men were you know, rolling their eyes, I'd be the one that says, you okay there? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, that. But that's the thing. It may come across as, oh, she's a bit ignorant or she's a bit rude or she's overconfident. But sometimes when certain groups do that to you, they make you feel confident, even though Joe said it could be your own perception. But if someone makes you feel un uncomfortable, I'm the type of person that says, well, I'll make you uncomfortable too. Mm -hmm. nice. So let's see how that goes out. And then maybe we'll just be normal in the room and no eye rolling. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, just following on from that, really, I, I, over time, probably, I have the benefit of having done it for quite a long time, I wouldn't really care what they think, mm -hmm. because as long as you're doing what you're doing yeah. and you're not being more confident than other people in the room, you're not overclaiming, you have done all your homework, you've got all of your experiences, mm -hmm. I don't care what they think, I don't care if they put a negative perception on it, mm -hmm. you know, that's their problem, not mine, as, as Jackie said earlier. But it is hard, isn't it? I mean, you've, yeah. you've been labelled certain things in the press because of um, yeah. your position, yeah. and that is difficult. No, I think there's a conception that if it's, you know, if a man is powerful and a man is, is seen as tough, then that's kind of very respected. And I think if a woman is, it's seen as a, as a negative. And I think that's still the case. And that's, you know, to your first question earlier, you know, I had kind of name calling in newspapers, you know, that called me the Rottweiler um, for kind of protecting my clients. But you can either be bothered by it or thinking, I'm doing my job well, that's all that tells me. So, <laughs> and then you, and you keep going. But you know, it is that difference in how they treat men, how they treat women. And a re sure. recurring theme around how you challenge and still be effective as well, I think, which is part of that question, because you, you could challenge and then it might be harder to make the progress mm. you want. But and Vicky Orweiss always had a great line, but she would just say, I beg your pardon. If somebody said something that was ridiculous or offensive, <laughs> yeah. uh, but she would, I could just imagine her doing it in the, in the way that you would. Yeah. She would stand up for yeah. herself, but she'd yeah. say, I, and then the person was forced to either repeat it or realize what they'd said. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe just feigning being hard of hearing from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it works, it, it, it actually works. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. also find, I think, um, sort of almost using being a woman, in that when you're being super confident or you might say something that's a little bit, you could call it arrogant or um, sometimes as a woman, I find it's, it comes across as less aggressive. So I sometimes find I can get away with a little bit more so I can be a bit cheeky um, because I can almost do it in a softer way. So it's, it's sort of almost using the nuances of who you are. Um, you know, I like taking the piss, so I'll be sarcastic. 
but I think sometimes if a male did it, it would, it would come across as aggressive, whereas I'll do it, and I hope, oh, no, I'm saying it, <laughs> they might find me really aggressive, but, you know, I sometimes think, you know, f you find your own way, um, so, yeah, it could be seen as confident, it could be seen as just being cheeky, it's, you know, you can use, use your character to sort of define that word. And I think it's something as well, I think you said, Pippa, something about your confidence has changed as you've got older, younger. And uh, we had an event last week with a group of young women from Premier League clubs and beyond. And one of them said, we we're talking about who inspires you. And she said, I am my own inspiration. And I just thought that's brilliant. Oh, and no. what happens to you that you <laughs> lose that confidence? <laughs> you lose that confidence that maybe you had as a child before mm -hmm. people started putting you in a box or saying you're you know, bossy rather than have executive leadership skills. So I think like, we should probably talk to our younger selves as well a little bit and you know, think about them and what they would be saying in that room, perhaps. Um, we have five minutes left, so we probably have time for one more question if anyone has a, got one at the back there. And then I'm going to ask our panel to wrap up with concluding thoughts. Hi, um, I'm Esther and I work for Premier League Productions. Uh, my question is about feedback and for you guys, how you take and give feedback to your clients if they're working in the media or maybe for Pippa for yourself, how you've taken feedback. It's something that I'm having to do more and more in my role if I'm producing shows and sometimes you've got quite recently retired footballers coming on and like you were saying earlier, Joe, they're quite new and they ask me for feedback and it's about being able to give it in a way where you're being helpful and not just saying, yeah, it was, it was fantastic, but also not knocking people's confidence or putting them off, I guess. Mm. Oh, I think footballers are the best to give feedback to because they're used to it. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to tiptoe around them. Mm. They want feedback. Yeah. I had a client on a show last Monday, it's the first bit of TV is done, nine o'clock in the morning, well, midnight, how was it? <laughs> nine o'clock in the morning, right, what's the feedback? And I was like, God, the producer's not even up yet. Like, <laughs> give me a minute. Um, but actually, athletes, they're high achievers and they're used to criticism. Yeah. Yeah. If we can make it constructive criticism, great. Um, so yeah, I think in my job, athletes are great to work with for that. Yeah, 100%. What was the question for me, sorry? Just how do you take any criticism or constructive feedback you're given and channel that in like a positive way rather than it knocking your confidence, I guess? Oh, I, I always welcome feedback. Um, because like I said, I started off on YouTube, so I'm used to literally getting feedback from absolute strangers. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to hold back, whether, it, whether they're going to be over polite or if they're going to be like, well, you're rubbish, get back in the kitchen. <laughs> um, I've always, you know, had feedback. So when it's now more in a professional setting, I appreciate even more because either they're giving me that feedback to obviously help me progress in my roles. Um, and whether I've done something wrong or not to the standard that they're used to, it's always great feedback for me and I'm, I would always welcome it. And I think if you're taking feedback or giving it aim to assist, like, or think of it in that way, it shouldn't be there as, mm. cons as criticism mm. or, or putting people down. It should be punitive. It should be to make things better. So if you can give it with that spirit and be clear about it and take it. Yeah. If, it if it assists you, take it. If you don't think it yeah. really helps, you don't have to do yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. I don't throw football boots at my clients. <laughs> happy. Oh. <laughs> Anything's an improvement. Brilliant. Great. Well, I think we are going to have to draw it to a close because um, we've got two minutes left and we've got the furthest walk to coffee. Um, but I mean, I just I do want to thank our inspirational speakers for all the wisdom, insights, honesty that they've given us today. It's been brilliant to hear. I'm going to leave you. I started with three words. You can have a few more if you want them, but just any final reflections or if you want to share a goal or a dream for your future in terms of your media confidence or presenting is there an interview you'd love to do is there a client you'd love to book uh, goals hopes dreams or a final piece of advice it's completely up to you oh go, go, go on, on you go. go no i was just <laughs> going to say mine would be on confidence and it's just know your usp like we're all really different yeah and we all bring something different to the table to the party to the room so you know i think when we were younger we probably all tried to be the same and you know it's like when you're a teenager and just want to be like everyone else and i think especially when i was at that leaders thing and I just wanted to be like all them and I wanted to, <laughs> them to all want to talk to me and let me be in their gang. And then I went back the next day and I was like, no, I am me and I'm quite interesting. And if they bother to talk to me, they might know that. So it's kind of just, yeah. just know that you're unique and that's your USP and that's a good thing. Such good advice and reassuring that you still feel that way, Joe, because you're kind of probably who everyone wants to be when we grow up. So <laughs> I think that you still feel so. that. Yeah. Um, Actually, I do remember I tweeted years ago um, that I always wanted to have my own women's football show. I haven't got one yet, but I did actually create my own magazine show. So I would say a bit of advice on top of that is to always create opportunities for yourself while still dreaming big. So, yeah. Love that. Well, we will make it happen between us. Yeah. <laughs>
I think I'm back to something that we started off the day with, which is, you know, we all have those moments where we're not feeling super confident or what we say to ourselves. And genuinely, if you act confident, and people believe it. So it's fake it till you make it. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Caroline. Well, I mean, when I set out, it was probably just to have my own company and be able to kind of pick and choose who my clients were so that I get up and get to work with nice and inspiring people every day. So I feel quite lucky with, with where I'm at. Um, the only thing I would say to people is I would, you know, anyone here that's thinking of, of doing their own company or doing their own thing, just take the risk and do it because there's a million people that told me that it wouldn't work. Mm. And you proved them all wrong. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> um, I think our panellists will be around for the coffee break. We're moving back through to the yellow lounge for that and then back, to, I think, to the main room for four o'clock for our final session with Emma Hayes. And I'm sure she will show us a thing or two about presenting and confidence. Yes. So <laughs> we can look forward to that. But if you put your hands together and thank our panellists.